We use our planet as a bit of a testing bed, a testing ground for these principles. We've discovered principles of physics, principles of geology, principles of life, and we've done that through testing out those principles in environments here on this Earth. And so if we're looking at the idea of follow the water in order to understand life, what's been fascinating to discover is that there are, in fact, aspects of water, aspects of the hydrosphere on our own planet that we've yet to discover. This was a study that came out a couple of months ago, but quite frankly, I've been working on this since my own PhD for over 20 years, working on these deep waters that occur, as you see described here, below the surface of our own planet. We access them through mines, in this particular case, a copper zinc mine in Timmins, Ontario, northern Ontario. Uh, and just as we've seen photographs of salty waters bubbling up from the depths of the ocean, there are salty waters that bubble up from the depths of the earth as well. This particular photograph is taken, I'm afraid, we haven't been able to persuade John Cameron to come down with us yet. So unfortunately, you'll see these are taken on my grad student's cell phones and they don't have the high resolution quality of John and Kevin's pictures. But nonetheless, I'll give you a sense of what's going on here. This is about 2.4 kilometers deep in the Timmins mine. I'll just start it again rather than have you see all the rest of that stuff. But it, uh, it gives you an idea of a phenomenon that takes place all over the world. We found these kinds of waters in mines throughout the Canadian Shield, the Fennoscandian Shield in Finland, in Sweden, and in particular work that we've done in South Africa. But the exciting thing was last year, this water in particular, we were able to get a sense of its residence time using dissolved noble gases. And this is where these billion-year residence times came out. So that's fascinating for life because, as I mentioned, we've worked in these waters for a long time. We haven't worked in waters as old as the ones that were found last year in Timmins, <coughs> but for many years we've been working in South Africa, for instance, in a phenomenon that looks a lot like what I just showed you. And back in 2006, in waters found in South African gold mines at 2.4 kilometers, these were about 25 million years in age we actually found living microbial ecosystems. Systems that are not living from photosynthesis, but are drawing their energy for life from water rock reactions. Now, unfortunately, this gets portrayed by Ripley's Believe It or Not by this rather outrageous cartoon here. Um, the species of bacteria living two miles underground feeds on radioactive water. It's always rather terrifying for scientists to see what can happen sometimes when your work gets translated. This was not radioactive water. What these organisms were actually living on was hydrogen, but hydrogen produced by radiogenic reactions in the crust, which is where the mistake came out. But nonetheless, this is one of the deepest microbial ecosystems, still living, still turning over, that had ever been identified. And so if that was found in 25 million year old waters, you can imagine one of the very interesting things that we're doing now is taking a look at these waters throughout the world doing something that we refer to sometimes as the Galapagos of the deep. Down to about one to one and a half kilometers, depending on where you are, we've got systems that we've been able to characterize as ranging in age from tens of thousands to tens of millions of years. The Timmins site pushed us way back with these waters that clearly go back with components back to billions of years in age. And essentially what all of these systems on a global scale provide us with are these hydrogeologically isolated time capsules. And what we're trying to do now is go back to these different fracture systems that have been cut off on different timescales and to take a look at the islands of subsurface life that may be associated with these waters in one place versus another, to compare what we might have found in South Africa to what we might find in younger waters, but also to what we might find in much older deep subsurface waters. All of this working closer than a number of microbiologists because of the implications for the evolution of life. We may see different organisms in fracture waters of different depth and history and age, and for the habitability of our planet. Because certainly 20 years ago, we had no inkling that you could have life existing two and three kilometers deep in the planet. But as we've seen, where there's water, there's life. And clearly, these organisms have found ways to eke out a living, even cut off from the photosphere. In Timmins, have we got life yet? Next to being asked what the water tastes like, that's my second biggest question we get asked. At the moment, we are in the midst of doing that analysis. We don't yet know if anything's living in those billion-year-old waters. 
The third question I get asked is, what if we find there's nothing there? Does that shut all this down? Are we not interested anymore? And so I just want to close on that point. Do we care? I mean, obviously it's going to be exciting if we find life in those waters, but do we care if we find nothing? And the fact is, the question of finding nothing is almost as exciting, because one of the key things that's coming out right now in our space research is an understanding that when we're looking for life, one of the key things we also need to do is to understand what's referred to as the abiotic baseline. This is in the literature from NASA for a couple of years. You can see it in the exploration strategy for Mars. Most significantly, the Mars 2020 science definition team pointed this out, that if we're going out looking for life, it's extremely important for us to grasp this principle, that the scientific significance of any potential sign of life or past life comes not only from us at saying the probability that life produced this, but also so that we don't make a mistake. We need to also grapple with the other side of the question. The possibility that that signature that we want to take as evidence of life is improbability or impossibility of non-biological processes producing it. And just to make that a little more self-evident, what I like to refer to this as is the question of haystacks and needles. If we think about Mars for a minute, we all recognize at this point, Mars is likely to be an abiotic haystack, a planet that at least now, we may be searching for signs of past life or present life, but what we know for sure right now is that the surface of the planet appears to be primarily dominated by non-biological processes. And we're up there with the rovers searching for that little popping up of the head, hoping that there may be some signature of biological life, a biological needle in an abiotic haystack. But we're doing that, we're testing out all our techniques on a planet that has the inverse problem. We're testing them out on our planet, which is a planet that has now been so successfully overprinted by life that we have almost no places on the planet yet left that might actually show us what the planet might have looked like before life arose. And so some of us are out there trying to find abiotic needles in this biological haystack. And if we find that, in particular in some of these deep subsurface processes, given that the surface of Mars is dominated by geological processes and we're looking for signs of life in that abiotic haystack, one of the things that some of us here are grappling with in Earth analog research and exploration is this challenge on a planet dominated by life. Can we get deep enough into the subsurface to actually find environments where life has lost its toehold, and where we can actually look at some of these abiotic processes. So obviously I'll be thrilled if we find something living in the Timmins waters, but it'd be equally intriguing if we in fact find that we found an abiotic system. So with that, I'll wrap up with that last idea, and uh, we'll open the floor for questions. Thank you.